Okay. Visionary, commissioner, founder, CEO, leader. Just a few of the titles that Heather Hiles has held. Ms. Hiles has led several organizations, including the San Francisco Unified School District, Silicon Valley Venture Fund, and Pathbright, which she also founded. She has also served her community on the boards of such organizations as Communities United Against Violence and the AIDS Legal F Referral Panel. Please join me in welcoming Heather Hiles, Deputy Director of Post-Secondary Student Success at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Oh, also, is there a clock that I can see? Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, uh, what I wanted to talk with you about is what we're up to at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And, um, and I'll get into a little bit of detail about what it is that we're funding and looking at. Um, and and then I'm uh, really looking forward to a Q&A session where I can answer your questions. So if, if you have some that build up while I'm speaking, please note them down and, and we can get into that. Um, it's much more interesting than listening to me speak <laughs> by myself. Um, so I have 25 years of experience in education, a lot of it having spent in the um, K-12 space. I am a former school board commissioner in San Francisco Unified, served on the board of um, a set of charter high schools for eight years. Um, my whole job while I was uh, working my way through undergraduate at UC Berkeley was have, running a tutorial program for kindergarten through third graders. Um, I've run a job training program with high school kids. And in the 90s, I actually built training programs to get women from welfare into careers. And that was some of the most fulfilling work I've ever done. Um, and as was said most recently, prior to joining the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I spent time building up a digital e-portfolio platform called Pathbright, which has about five million-ish um, mostly college students on the platform who are all looking to tell their stories of achievement and learning um, to employers and to their professors and such. Um, the reason that I was called, I think, to join the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is that there is a deep, deep-rooted commitment on behalf of Bill and Melinda to help people who have um, until now been disenfranchised and not succeeded in pursuing and achieving their academic as well as their professional goals. And I'll tell you more specifically what that looks like and what we're doing, um, but I just want you to know from where I come in helping people, I, I've committed my whole life to helping people realize their academic and their professional goals, so um, I'm a good fit, I think, for the foundation and vice versa. Um, <laughs> These little baby turtles inspire me, so I never miss an opportunity to show their pictures. <laughs> um, but the, the, uh, the scene here is that these little creatures, once they hatch from the eggs, if you're not familiar, they've got to make it down to the ocean in order to survive and thrive. And along the way, you know, these big birds swoop down and take them out, eat them. <laughs> um, they don't know which direction they're going in, really. They just instinctively know to get down to the ocean. And they have no idea what's ahead of them once they actually reach the ocean. That's where the real ad adventure uh, begins. And these little baby turtles, I think of as the people who are trying to succeed in acquiring some skills so that they can succeed in life and you know, take care of and provide for their families and, the, and themselves. And um, our goal at the, at the foundation is to help those people who have historically not been successful by themselves because they haven't had the resources that some of us have been able to draw on. And so that's um, just mindset-wise, that's where, where I come from. Um, the vision specifically in the post-secondary success part of uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where I work is that we want to work with our partners to help 
about 11 million people by the year 2025 be prepared for new economy jobs. So the 11 million number actually comes from economists who believe there will be a gap and there will be 11 million people who do not, if things go as usual, who will not be prepared for new economy jobs. And I think we see every day and <clears throat> how many people are already disenfranchised. Um, but it seems like that gap between the opportunities as the nature of work changes um, is growing wider rather than getting smaller. And, um, and so we know that there are about 4.3 million people, we look at a lot of data over at the foundation, about 4.3 million people who, um, who are dropping out of two-year and four-year institutions right now that we could, with lots of interventions, which we'll call solutions over it at the foundation, um, who with a little bit of extra support hopefully can complete and obtain their credentials. And then um, there are about another five and, and, and some change million people who probably won't attend any college or university, but who are still needing to upgrade or acquire new skills in order to be ready for career well-paying jobs by the year 2025. And so we're also looking beyond college and universities at what are the other kinds of new trending, new opportunities for acquiring skills for these jobs. And so that's, that's, what I, um, that's what I am responsible for. My portfolio is called Solutions for that very reason. And um, uh, I, I won't bore you with a lot of data, but I will say this is a, a striking um, number for me. Only 11% of employers really believe that graduating undergraduates who complete college are prepared for even entry-level jobs. So they don't seem to have a big connection or a lot of faith into what our students are learning in colleges and universities right now. And those are the people who actually get the credentials. So I think we have a lot of work to do, and I really appreciate that the community here is thinking about the connections between education, skills acquisition, and actual work, because I, that's, that's my passionate area, that's my point of passion as well. But I think that that's, um, I, I think it's the more we can have the joint conversations about education, skills development, and, and the world of work and what that looks like, the better. Um, within my portfolio specifically, and the solutions that, w that I was going to drill down into today are primarily um, regarding the college and university interventions or solutions that we have data and believe in um, will, that will help our, our students succeed and complete. So the biggest ones uh, that we focus on include digital learning, developmental education, what we call student services, which is advising plus financial security. So that includes financial aid packaging, it includes emergency aid, work study, and then transfer. <clears throat> uh, regarding digital learning, we have um, recently done a lot of return on investment studies to understand what are best practices around digital learning um, supports at an institutional level and what kind of impact can they have on those most disenfranchised, um, highest at risk students that I just discussed and we're squarely focused on. And um, some of the findings that I think are really important to be aware of are not always, um, not always popular amongst um, leadership and faculty at an institution, but nonetheless have really proven themselves to be important. Um, number one is that Thinking about digital learning offerings um, for students who come onto campus but have access to what we call mixed modality offerings or online courses as they need them is really important to the majority of our students who are employed, have families, need flexibility. We find that on average students who have access to online courses to supplement their in-class experiences complete on average one semester faster and um, while maintaining the exact same grades or, and sometimes in some cases improving their A, B, and C uh, level grades. And um, 
that's not so unpopular, but what becomes unpopular is the, also the notion that if you get a standardized curriculum that is delivered for gen ed courses, you have reliability around the outcomes that you don't see if each faculty member is selecting their own, own courses. And so administrators will receive a lot of flack for suggesting that they take, they're taking away any of the autonomy of individual faculty. But the data are showing that if you make institutional level decisions on curriculum and you have that, and it can be a master course created by a faculty member who's the dean of you know, the mathematics department and people get to refine it every year or, or whenever, that's fine. But just having one standardized curriculum that everybody uses really works. And, um, and so, you know, you can draw on OER content, can draw on third party created curriculum or master content created by faculty. That's really not the main point. Um, by providing online courses, you also, we also find that, uh, especially for your institutions, where they've had tenured faculty teaching gen ed courses, realize a lot of savings at the institutional level. One, because uh, usually adjunct faculty are the ones teaching the online courses. And then secondly, they don't have the, um, the, uh, all the expenses that come with having in-person courses, classrooms, um, the operating expenses. So, um, uh, but we have found, like I said, a lot of return on investment also at two-year institutions, especially for the students who complete faster, so they need less financial aid. They're more likely to complete. Um, the, and, and what I will say is also at the foundation, we are looking at two different kinds of goals. One is what can we do to realize the opportunity for return on investment for the student and for the institution? And we're also looking at, um, uh, so the, what technologies are actually scalable and usable and reliable? And then we're also looking in another kind of area at what are the innovations in online learning, may, perhaps inquiry-based, virtual reality or augmented reality. What are new kinds of digital learning experiences that are even more engaging for our students? So those are two separate kinds of goals that we're both, we're driving towards both of those within the foundation. Um, another really important area for our students who, um, who have not been successful in the past is regarding developmental education. And um, within de developmental education, we're looking at a number of best practices ranging from pedagogy to in, um, supports for the student in terms of better tutoring, tutoring and such. A redesigned placement. We know that um, um, historically and currently um, minorities, underrepresented minorities, typically test in a poorer way and so they are more likely to get placed into remedial courses and that, you know, remedial math, dev ed math is the biggest um, loss point of, of those same students. Um, we're also looking at what we call co-requisite design, meaning compressed courses where you have uh, credit-bearing courses additive to remedial courses so that people continue on the path and they're not, you know, taking a semester or a year's worth of non-credit-bearing courses. And then there are really powerful innovations around math and English pathways that stimulate and, uh, and help connect students to understanding the relevance of their trajectories of what they need to master in English and math. And there are fantastic models around the country, and I brought um, some notes up here just to remember to, to call out some of them, but from a pedagogy perspective, um, the Ramp Up Math program at Middlesex Community College, seeing fantastic uh, outcomes with their Emporium model, where they've got kind of like a computer lab bigger than this, and they've got sort of a flip model rotating and circulating tutors, helping people succeed on their own through, through do online courses. Um, from, from a supports perspective, and I'll talk a little bit more ad about advising in a minute, but CUNY's ASAP program, extremely powerful in um, connecting advising with remediation and program planning and financial incentives. Um, around placement, both Long Beach Community College and Central Piedmont Community College 
have seen um, 15 point increases, um, percentage point increases in the progress of successful transfers from the two year to the four year. And um, Tennessee Community College uh, with their comp compressed paths are seeing as much as 40% percentage point increases in, um, in the completion of the Gateway Math courses as a result of their redesigns. So there's a lot of good stuff happening out there. Part of our role at the foundation is to help organize and synthesize and prioritize and then disseminate the information about what we're learning. Um, and actually in that, um, in that regard, we are, <clears throat> within my group, we are putting up what we're calling a knowledge management platform that will be available to the entire field um, to find and access all of the reports, case studies, implementation guides, best practices, product indexes, all of these resources that we've invested in for years and make them available to the entire higher ed field. So that will be live and really, I think, robust by the beginning of 2018. Um, it is now being used in a lot of testing areas as we start to po post more assets and we have institutions posting learning logs and starting to build communities of practice right now. Uh, from the student services perspective, um, I'm a huge advocate for it, as is the whole foundation regarding holistic advising. And what that means to me is first of all, thinking about kind of the framework that a lot of us have adopted around guided pathways, which is really a, a, a framework to describe the student journey and to acknowledge that on the front end, in order to get a student engaged, he or she really needs to have um, a vision for what kind of career trajectory they're looking for. And as a result, what kinds of educational programs do they need to avail themselves of? and then a plan around what kind of financial aid uh, supports do they require in order to, to obtain that education, and all the while making sure that there are the right kinds of supports provided by people at the right time from an academic perspective and from a financial aid perspective and from a life skills perspective to keep that student successful. Um, and where we're seeing, obviously, the um, the biggest cost in the area of advising is the human capital. What we're hoping is that as we see certain platforms start to evolve, there'll be a, um, a consolidation of the right data that someone needs to, to access in order to be a good advisor, and that we can optimize the time and the kind of interaction at the right time for the right student. And, um, Seeing a more career information fed on the front end of advising and on an ongoing basis, and then also seeing more of the financial aid data um, when a student is in jeopardy or if they need some other kinds of supports, also interacting with their academic data so that we know whatever kind of crisis the students um, are, are coming up against, that somebody can help them, guide them through the process is very important. Um, <clears throat> another big, uh, another important solution that I've alluded to is the transfer process. We see so many people who um, are close to completing to your experience and, and um, unfortunately they'll take a lot of the wrong courses that don't get, and they don't get credit against their, um, against their four-year degree. And um, a lot of sloppy, if you will, transfer articulation from the two-year to the four-year. And uh, a lot of people get lost along the way. A lot of turtles get moving in the wrong direction. Um, and so that is another area where we continuously look for opportunities to help um, bridge some gaps. Um, I'll go back to this for a second. Um, what I will say is that um, we are looking to um, provide, like I said earlier, t information to the, to the industry uh, as we can organize it by different best practices and different players all throughout the country. And so you can imagine that even though we have a, a pretty robust team at the foundation, we're just small players in a very enormous and ever-changing arena. So how I would define each of the solutions 
uh, where we see the best and highest impact opportunities will vary by the type of institution, will vary, vary by the geography, uh, will vary, vary, vary and evolve over time. Um, and so this is really a, a live body of work that we continue to work every day. Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's what we're doing over at the uh, post-secondary group within the Gates Foundation. So I hope that that was a helpful overview and I would love to, um, I would love to get in dialogue uh, to answer any of your questions. Thank you. <laughs> and while uh, microphones are, I hope you guys have some kind of questions, while microphones are circulating, uh, what I will add is we're working on a separate evidence base that is uh, much more um, nascent and hasn't been fully adopted, but we see a lot of trends in new, new models of training that are, like I said, um, really built for people who either need a, still a better bridge from the educational experience into the job market or are supplemental to a, a credential or are, for some people, um, a fine alternative to a credential. And so there are a lot of new kinds of models that we um, get to experiment with and observe and track and um, I think will be a kind of a new body of alternatives that we will be starting to more um, robustly invest in in, the, in those new training mo programs. Apprenticeship programs are back, which I'm delighted about. Um, there are some good staffing company kinds of models where people do a little bit, where the companies do a little bit more specific skills training and then place people directly into jobs. And, um, and then there are some, just some focused technical skills training. So for example, if you used to do sales at Marshalls, but you could do software sales, you might be making $100,000 or more a year um, by doing sales in software. And so we want people to avail themselves of the kinds of technical trainings if that is going to improve their career you know, um, outlook as well. Yep. Hi. Hi, Heather. Um, so thanks for the presentation. Uh, at the beginning, you talked about the um, physical infrastructure uh, versus the, the cost of, do, of taking classes online and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Do you have any numbers in terms of how much an institution could save by by starting to offer some of these online classes, and what are like the like the, the, the figures that you could that would go with that? Yeah, we have actually a lot of data, and I don't carry it all around with me, nor have I memorized all of it. But for example, at an institution like a UCF, UC, University of Central Florida, there um, that four-year institution is seeing um, on the order of. Uh, um, on the order of half a million dollars a year of savings for, for certain courses. Um, and so it really can sort of add up. And um, it really does matter, like I said, with four years, they've seemed to have more savings in the long run in that they have, um, they have more adjunct faculty and others to leverage in a different kind of way. Um, but, um, you know, what we look at, when we look at the return on investment, we look at it for the institution for faculty and for the student, and we think about what are the value propositions for them. Because also I just want to point out that a savings for an institution does not necessarily mean savings for the student. And so we want to be clear about the differences. And I'd be happy to share with this community the data. It will be up live on our site soon, but um, in the interim I'm happy to give you the facts and figures for different kinds of institutions. We look at two-year institutions, we're looking at what we call sort of lean and um, more stealth, smaller four-year institutions, and then we're looking at, there are a couple of, or a few of the really big ones, like the UCF and ASU and others, and we try to put them in kind of different categories so that similar kind of organizations can figure out which, which are we most like in terms of geography and dynamics and where could the biggest returns be had. So I'm happy to make sure that you get more concrete data. Yes. Hi, Heather. Chris Lurkin. Hi. Thanks for this uh, helpful overview. 
I'm thinking about your numbers, the 11 million um, adults who uh, will go uncredentialed or go lacking in jobs in the future economy, yeah. the 5 million. So I'm th thinking about how, how do you guys, how do you at Gates segment the learner market in terms of the more traditional student, the older adult learner, um, maybe the 25 plus, 30 plus, right. re-credentialing, uh, um, under-credentialed, and where is your, has your focus changed at the, at the foundation, and, and what do you expect to focus on going forward? So we do focus, um, I'd say exclusively actually, on underrepresented minorities, low-income folks, and first-generation students. So we're looking at the most disenfranchised and those people who, without other interventions, are going to drop out. And um, so, for now at least, that's our focus, is the, the, the most um, at risk. And, um, and the breakout, we do a lot of modeling. Um, there are a lot of economists who do modeling that, uh, work that we avail ourselves of to break out the, the various uh, sections and um, demographics of, of, of the college student today. Uh, I, I decided this was an eye chart, so I was just going to skip right on over it. Um, again, we could share with you lots of models that help segment out the different types, but we know things like, we know information like over 70% of our students that we target are working while they're in school. Uh, we know that the majority are um, low income and the majority are, are, or a lot of them are working poor. Um, we only focus on public institutions. That's another um, um, cut that I should share. And, um, and we prioritize um, uh, institutions that serve, the, the, where the majority of their students are Pell Grant recipients, et cetera. Hi, Goldie. We didn't get enough time today, this morning, huh? Is it on? Hi, I'm Goldie Blumenstick from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, you talked about the transfer pathway. Um, yeah. I think officially people kind of know things that work. They know about sort of um, the, pa the, the pathway program. They know about articulation agreements, and they know about sort of structuring this um, these kind of transfer pathways through catchment areas between four-year institutions and two-year institutions. Yep. And we've kind of known this for years. Yep. So I guess I'm wondering what is it about the system that, that, that keeps, keeps these programs from working as effectively as they could be in most places? Right. I think I have a, a back-end answer and a front-end answer. Um, I like to um, get into the operations on the back-end. That's just more of my personal uh, comfort, comfort zone. But um, we know that there are a lot of um, inefficient processes, literally people processing paperwork of um, who gets processed and admitted and enrolled faster than other students. Um, we know that there are a lot of, um, I think we know there have been so many redundancies and um, uh, kind of manual processes to make sure that a student actually will get credit for the courses they've already taken that just shouldn't exist. <laughs> they should just be cleaned up and there's a lot of should-haves in the world that just don't get, you know, show themselves. So I think that that's a lot of the transfer. You're right, there's not any kind of um, brilliant, you know, missed technology opportunities, I wouldn't say. I would say we have all the tools available to us and we have, especially kind of with the lowercase p of policy that is created within systems that could really um, make the wheelhouse run better uh, if there were some standardization and some rigor around what gets accepted, how it's communicated to advisors and to students early on. Um, I will say one of the trends of technology is providing more real-time information to the students around financial aid, around degree planning, around what credit-bearing courses they must take in order to be on on path to complete on time, um, different programs. And all of that information, if you can find ways to deliver it in a way that is consumable, easily consumable for the student and real time available to them as they're making decisions, um, I think the better. And so I, I am very optimistic and I do think that that's a place where a lot of, um, 
a lot of artificial intelligence, a lot of technology that sends the information to students right in the right time. You must get you know, your former transcripts or whatever piece of information over the summer to um, the institution before you're able to, to, to get enrolled or you have to get your shots, whatever the things are, um, to, to get your financial aid. All of these kinds of information sent to the student at the right time uh, really can be automated and really can take out the, um, the human error kinds <laughs> of areas. So I, I would say that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit just in having good operations, having good agreements within systems, and then better availing ourselves of better technologies to uh, inform and prompt the student to make the right, uh, take the right steps at the right time. Does that help? Was that? Technologies aren't free. No, they are not. Um, and for an institution, um, if they deploy the right uh, technology, the notion is that they will retain more students and they will be more self-sustaining because it's very expensive for an institution to have to replace a student who has dropped out. So if you can actually avail yourselves of technology that helps students be more successful and complete, you should be able to um, run in the black as an institution better than if um, you're losing so many students and having to replace them. So that's the, that's the big theory and that's why we even care about a return on investment is to show institutions that if you make these changes you will, more of your students will succeed and you will do better financially. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a person here. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> she has a mic. Hi, Heather. Uh, my name is Kate Kazen, and um, enjoyed your presentation. I just moved to Seattle, so I think about the Gates Foundation often. Um, <laughs> and I went in the tail end of the previous administration to a really wonderful uh, day that the foundation helped sponsor um, called Rem Remedying Remediation. And <laughs> one of the most powerful things about it was that it started with the students. And these were all students who were, quote, successful, but who had nonetheless gone, come through developmental education. And the definition of successful in their case was that they had come through developmental education uh, and gone on. What I'm struck by, and I'm wondering how you all think about this, mm -hmm. is you know, to what extent <clears throat> fixing developmental ed education so more people pass through it is I don't want to say deck chairs on the Titanic, but it's in some sense continuing what is really um, not only demoralizing, but sort of systemically, I would say, oppresses students of color, mm -hmm. um, low-income students, and even making it more efficient doesn't necessarily get at that the f idea is not to fix developmental education. The idea is to give students support they need to be successful in college. Amen. You know, and yeah. you know, my mantra is always label skills, not students. You know, and right. I'm just wondering to what extent, since I understand some of this was informed by people doing work in developmental education, right. whether you're sort of hearing from the adherents, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to the faith as opposed to people who are kind of loyal questioners. And I, I yeah. wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, whether that's a dilemma or a tension for yeah. you all and how you resolve yeah. it. Yeah, it's a personal dilemma, actually, so I appreciate the question. Um, I feel like there is a lot of historical stigma and, and real-time stigma that comes with being labeled a developmental student. Um, and I, um, I'm really disinterested in your age, your gender, um, your grade. I just want you to have the best learning experience that works for you. And uh, that's where I see a lot of the opportunity, especially in digital learning, to bring that to fruition. So actually, even organizationally within my group, I'm having a very delicate uh, uh, dance of trying to bridge more of the what we call historically developmental education best practices, which I believe work for all students and all learners, with the best of technology, which I believe can go back into high school, can get people caught up, can get them to advance, and um, again, doesn't matter what type of student you are. So, um, so that, is, that is a thing. And meanwhile, there is a movement and, um, that has been really successful at uh, bringing up all those different kinds of best practices that do help students who have um, been undereducated in high school and do have to make up a lot of learning 
to be ready for on the ground college uh, educational experiences. And I don't want to undermine that in any kind of way because that's been a really important movement. There's a whole group called Strong Start to Finish which has organized funders including the foundation, all the thought leaders in the area. And in my in, uh, humble opinion though, hasn't leveraged the best of product and technology yet. So um, that we're trying to kind of rethink um, how we think and talk about learning and teaching. Um, I will also say that, uh, um, you know, sometimes we get a little bit lulled into, uh, with the education space of thinking that there's one solution, one silver bullet, and there's one kind of term of art that is the thing that's going to succeed. And it's just not that simple, as you, as you know. And so I think um, trying to challenge all of us to think creatively and to be informed by other disciplines. Um, you know, being a technologist and having launched a, a product and a company um, from, from in high technology, I am very used to, to taking a blank sheet of paper and thinking about the end user and designing an experience for them. And what I've realized at the foundation and working with a lot of the traditional players is that they have more of a social science approach. So it's very top down. How do we help the administrators and the faculty and the da 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 da? And eventually, maybe if you're lucky, you talk about the student. <laughs> and that's to me the the wrong, yeah, I, I like the other process better. I like to start with the end user, the student, and then try to optimize their experience. So there's a little bit of like, how do we mesh those different approaches? And, um, and so I'm hoping that we can have some positive influence from different kinds of industries and processes to influence how we rethink and how we have more human-centered um, approaches to the work. Uh, my name is Andrew Sears. I'm with City Vision University, and I was listening to Michael Saylor's talk that he gave at the last summit, and one of the statements he made, I don't know whether it's true or not, but he said that, you know, if Microsoft or Google or Amazon wanted to invest a billion dollars, they could provide a platform that could provide degrees to most people in the, in the world. Now, obviously, there's these other things needed. There's the human <laughs> side, and it's not the computer's going to do it all, right? Right. But there's this platform need. You know, I, I look at what's happened with Khan Academy and, yep. you know, they got, I mean, they're becoming the default platform for high schools, right? 50 well, to 100 million dollars. I mean, not, not high schools, or high school students to yeah. train them tutoring for high school students, yeah. right? But Sailor hasn't reached that scale. I mean, whenever I try to describe Khan, or Sailor Academy to people, I say it's kind of like the college counterpart to Khan Academy. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering why isn't there yet a college counterpart to Khan Academy that's gotten to that scale. Why isn't there these large scale platforms? And yeah. how do you think about that in your investments? I mean, it seems like most of your investments are on the, you know, gradual improvement scale, but some of these dis disruptive yeah. investments, um, yeah. how do you think about that? Yeah, um, I, I should have brought some other slides that I could, where I could show you kind of how I think about it and how I'm socializing it within the foundation. Um, but but the, there are some really captivating points that you made. Um, you know, I think that most of the big high technology companies have been so focused on solving easier to solve problems than the intractable educational problems that we're facing right now. And I think they're just starting to think about what at the scale that an Amazon or a Google plays in can they actually contribute to having you know, big shifts in our learning experiences and the success of our students. Um, so I think that um, in a very real way, there is a lot of evolution happening. When I see programs like the Galvanize um, uh, uh, labs, which are in some major cities, they're beyond boot camps. They literally have co-located their, you know, IBM Watson, Google, Microsoft, and they're literally doing coding camps, trying Watson, teaching you how to code and, uh, and correspond with these different systems. And um, one of the big things that I'm trying to bring about in addition to bringing um, and inspiring new technologies and high technology to apply themselves to educational problems is I'm also thinking about how do we get the tools and put in the, hand, in the hands of people who are who have not been successful, how do we put the tools for them to build their own solutions 
Uh, how do we get those tools into their hands? How do we help them? Because uh, in, in most technologies, you build a tool for yourself to solve your own problem because you best, know, you best understand those end users. And so we have a real problem where we have people creating tools in a very historical, institutional way that does, knows nothing about this group that has not been successful here. And so that's a huge chasm, and how do we correct for that? Um, so that's one of the things I, I think about. So I'll put that to the side. And then I'll say, in addition to the meat and potatoes of the solutions I just described to you, we have, um, and I have staffed up to do a lot more on the innovation front. So we do deep, deep research into virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, into um, AI and machine learning, into predictive analytics, into various technologies, and we understand the arc of the development maturity of the technologies, and then we're sponsoring competitions with players like Techstars, University Ventures, um, Kaggle, which is with Google, um, and many other players to help Kapor, um, to help have competitions where we can see new entrepreneurs deliver new solutions, new business models, new technologies, hopefully with using uh, applying new technologies to these in seemingly insoluble problems. And I think we've got to, so I've got an innovations bucket where we do smaller grants. And just to give you one uh, understanding of this life cycle, the foundation before I came had done a couple years of grant making in, in what seemed like a very scary little innovation area called OER, and five years ago, nobody was confident that this stuff would actually get itself together. Well, it really is, and it is truly disruptive to the traditional publisher market and the oligopoly, frankly, that they've had on all textbooks and courses. And so that is really a disruptive thing that we were able to take a chance on, and those solutions are actually scaling up right now. In fact, I was just talking to someone about not only the idea of open educational curricula, but also open educational assessments. So you really can have, from beginning to end, um, an affordable open course experience, because you have to have the assessment piece at the end. Um, so there's the innovation on the one end, and the other thing that, um, in addition to the grants that we do in my portfolio for the large-scale solutions, um, once they've kind of shown themselves and we have the evidence base uh, from the innovations area, we're also doing, and I'm ramping up more of our investment side. So we do have a separate kind of lar large pot of money to be able to invest in companies to try to stimulate more innovation um, from the kind of private sector commercial side to actually be able to do this. And we can do price guarantees that make the technology affordable to community colleges and four-year institutions. We can be a voice for our students on behalf and at the board table with these companies. And we can help guide them to make sure things be, stay affordable for our institutions and our students. So um, innovation, small scale innovation, the meat and potato, like longer term grants, you know, that we do like five, six year kind of grants with a lot of these big solutions. And then also leveraging uh, investments and broke, helping take our domain knowledge to bring together, you know, Google and other big players to help us really scale and really bring something fully to market. So we have a lot more kind of at our disposal that maybe we've, we've availed or really leveraged in the past. Okay, I think that's uh, the time we have. Oh, okay. So, uh, but please take opportunities to continue. The, Can we get the one more? The one guy. Who's do, okay. Page. I'm sorry. <laughs> Better be a good one, though. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, I'm kind of intrigued. With this 11 percent of employers. Yeah. Are, you know, that's that's a really scary, isn't it? Powerful and scary yeah. number. Right. Um, I think what's the balance in higher ed between gra getting students who finish school and preparing students or learners for the future, and I, right. and I look at your boss and many other people who never got the degree, right. and the question is, how do we play a role that's not really focused on graduation all the time, <clears throat> even that's though right. that is a good option, but there are right. many people who thrive never getting the degree, but everyone needs to learn, and so right. how, what are your thoughts from the foundation standpoint in preparing people for that, because I, I have students, because in entrepreneurship, when you teach entrepreneurship, if yeah. you're successful, they leave college. 
period. Yeah. Yeah. And then the school says, well, we just lost it alone in money. I'm like, absolutely not. I mean, look, Zuckerberg just went back to Harvard right. after being and, away for so long. And it, so is the new, and it is the new companies that create all the productivity. We as a country are at an all-time low in terms of actual productivity. And the only thing that's, it's not Facebook and these huge companies that create new jobs and inc increase productivity. It is startups to mid-sized companies that are, that are right. actually the engine for productivity. So that's another kind of point to your case. So uh, that 11% case your point. is that's from big companies, but the bottom right. line is, is are they prepared for actually launching things, sustaining things, right. failing, and have the resiliency to go back and to continue go back. their world. That's and that's what exactly. do we play as higher ed? I'm, I'm, I'm Steve Brandt from Bay Path University. Okay. And so what do we do to yeah. not be upset when a student leaves, but actually continue with them in our family? I don't know if the right. foundation has thought about that. Yeah, I mean, we do. And like I said, you know, it's kind of, um, there are different sort of orders of our priorities. I mean, what I want to do is I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I will not go where Peter Thiel goes and says, and say education doesn't matter. Because for too many of us, myself included, the, the, <laughs> the ascendancy into middle class experience has beca been because of my education, UC Berkeley and Yale for Business School. And I really don't feel like I'm entitled or other people should be entitled to say, oh, that doesn't matter to folks. So, you know, let's not, let's, it's not that black or white. Um, but what we do know is that if you're preparing students, and there's a great book called Stretch, written by a woman um, who used to be the chief learning officer at Sun Microsystems, uh, now is at SAP, and it's all about how to People need to manage their own careers in a gig-based economy. The world has changed significantly, as you know, and I think if you can impart upon your students, and I say this with one stepdaughter who just completed college <laughs> and is going to her first real job, and uh, one son who is pre-med and, and about to start his senior year in college, um, so I think about this topic a lot. If you can impart with them the skills of how to manage themselves to be lifelong learners, and who think holistically about the different pieces of what they need to learn just in time to do this challenge. And whether they stay in one company or whether they go to lots of different companies, you will learn, have to learn new skills to do new things again and again and again. So if you can learn in college how to learn what you need to do in order to achieve your next goal, that's really, I think, the ticket. And so if you can build communities where students and alumni and dropouts can all come back and get resources, and if you can empl engage employers to have real communication, real-time feedback about the nature and changing nature of jobs. Um, you know, when I was in business school, data scientist was not a thing at all. It is the biggest thing in Silicon Valley now. So, you know, it's just going to keep changing, and I think in, a, in an accelerated way. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, no, no, and we need to count different kinds of wins. Um, right, and I think I think we need to look for how do we support the entrepreneurs. Jim Gall um, Jim Clifton at Gallup is an amazing spotter of budding entrepreneurs and backs a lot of them. Um, but we need to continue to think how can the campus be a place for supporting entrepreneurs, for supporting all the different roles that we need people to take on in society. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much.